Hey folks, welcome to the Keith and Alana show. No, it's not. <laughs> it is Wine School. Debrief. Debrief it is. And today we're debriefing a class Alana taught on East Coast wines. Really fascinating class. Especially at the end when Alana goes into the one major point, the one major ecological detail that you need. Essential. Essential to make great wines on the East Coast. Okay. So, so watch for that. Yep. Yeah. And then also please. Oh, that's right. Like and subscribe. All right. All right. Got it. <laughs> All right. Let's watch this. Let's watch it. I just had to recall a few years ago, I was doing this class and somebody raised her hand, lovely lady, right in the beginning. And she's, I do not like East Coast wines. <laughs> well, thank you so much for announcing that. <laughs> she didn't like any wine that we poured. And then she proceeded to steal the glasses. And <laughs> <laughs> she's from Philly. I'm, hey, don't put that on me. You said that. If you want to start Okay, yeah, I think I will. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where she was from. But she had the gall to write in uh, a bad review. And we were like, yes, thank you, thank you very much. We would like our glasses back. Never heard from her again. <laughs> In any event, thankfully, we've been around for a long, long time, and we're very lucky. We're very blessed. We have lots of people who've been coming for ages and who have supported us throughout the years, especially the past two. So we tend to just attract phenomenal people. That was just one funny thing that I do recall every now and then when I teach this class. So this is going to hopefully shed some light, show you some new things about what's happening on the East Coast. The East Coast has uh, been attempted to be a wine region, honestly, since the Vikings landed here. And they called this area Vinland. They saw all these vines and they thought, great. Vines, we know what we get from that. Booze, this is going to be great. And what they found when they landed is that they could make really good grape juice and grape jelly and terrible wine. So we're going to talk a little bit um, of botany behind me so you can get an idea of the struggles, what people have to deal with, and then what is coming in the you know more modern era. So we have a really nice range stylistically tonight from traditional to really cutting edge, fun, natural stuff. So we are going to start with two white wines and then the remainder will be red wines. I am actually going to switch the order of the white wines. So we will be doing wine number one will be... Now I have to stop because in my head I have this picture of the colonists coming to America right. and finding the hills of vineyards and, and Vikings as winemakers. <laughs> You know, <laughs> um, you know. I think there'll be a lot of beheaded wine critics. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the picture in my head is uh, truly hilarious. Thanks for sharing, Keith. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. No. If the Vikings ran Napa Valley, it's yeah delightful. But that's another show. So they brought what was called Vitis vinifera. This is the winemaking vine that originated somewhere in Turkey, the South Caucasus, Anatolia. And this Vitis vinifera is what makes fine wine. Vitis vinifera hated the East Coast, absolutely hated it. And so they would plant it and it would die, plant it and it would die. Even Thomas Jefferson, at Monticello was not able to grow Vitis vinifera vines. So if you go to Charlottesville, they have Jefferson vineyards, those are all new. Even Jefferson could not grow Vitis vinifera. So what we had come in the 1800s was something called a hybrid. And what they did is they took American vines and crossed them with French vines. So what you would get was the hardiness of the American vine mixed with the flavor of the French vine. So those are called hybrids. These are things that did work very well on the East Coast. And in fact, these are the grapes that we still find planted throughout the East Coast today. So Sable Blanc, Chamboursin, Vidal Blanc, those are our hybrids, okay? So hybrids did well because they were hardy, they were cold resistant, they were humi 
humid resistant, and we also got the flavor of the grapes. So everything was going well. Good, good, good. But our vines would not last very long. They would die out after 20 or 30 years. Then came something called phylloxera. And phylloxera was a little aphid that lived in the roots of Vitis vinifera, and it wiped out the great vineyards of Europe. It, however, it did not wipe out the American vine. So eventually over time, they learned that to combat phylloxera, to, excuse me, whew, to combat phylloxera, they had to cross Vitis vinifera with American rootstock. And so today, this is a representation of basically every vine in the world, almost everywhere in the world, you have Vitis vinifera trunk and fruit, and in the ground, you have American rootstock. So our little aphid, our little root louse, munches on these roots, but because it's North American, they are impervious to it, they're immune, but they never reach up and get the fruit. So all of France's vineyards had to be replanted, all of Italy's, all of Spain's, and we even had an outbreak of phylloxera in Napa in the 1980s. So it is still something that is ongoing. So just to give you a background, the American vine is still very important because it gives protection from some pest and disease. I love this, and I want to draw uh, everyone's attention to, because you talked about this and it got edited out, but the difference between crosses and hybrids. Now, a hybrid, you mentioned like Chambersin, that's, right. that is a Vitis vinifera uh, wine grape and an American varietal, uh, which are typically not made for wine. There, there, that's the hybrid. But a cross is different. A cross is two varieties of Vitis vinifera. Right. Like for instance, um, a popular new one, or new in the last hundred years, is Pinotage. Right. And that is, I think, I know that's Pinot Noir, and I think Carignan, I think Sinso. it is. Since so, I knew you would know that. Oh, so I'm, there you go. So the yeah. two different distinctions, cross and hybrid. Awesome. And that's what this class is really about. Terral Dago is actually an Italian grape. This is from the Trentino region of Italy. So this is uh, in the Dolomites. It uh, is a cool area and they do Pinot Noir, they do Chardonnay, they do Pinot Gris, and this grape, Terral Dago. So they started growing in the U.S. Terral Dago in Michigan and Missouri. That's where this grape was first cultivated and it did so well that it's now expanded to the East Coast. Now, now, Lake Erie, just like the Finger Lakes, what that lake does is it helps moderate temperature. So it actually keeps the vineyard warmer during the winter and cooler during the summer. So what that does is give us what we call nice diurnal temperature swings. So I could have written that on the board as well. Diurnal temperature swings mean it's very hot during the day and very cool at night. That's what our grapes really like. It leads to even maturation of the berries. So we have nice balance of sugars and tannins. And tann awesome. Yes, so there it is. That's that's the secret to East Coast winemaking, to have that diurnal shift is having a large body of water near, near the vineyards. Very cool. Makes all, all the right. difference. And I want to deep cut on te uh, Terral Dago. Terral Dago. Dago. Like, the, you, you reach really far into our wine cellar. It's a great Atlanta. grape. I think we're yeah. going to see more of it on the East Coast. Yeah, I hope so. Okay. The one that you sourced was amazing. Really love that one. Thank you so much. Well, folks, thanks for joining us today on Wine School Debrief. Hope to see you again soon. Please like and subscribe. That's right. You should do that so I can buy more wine. Thank you. Bye. Bye.